Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Wang Men Wang, Director at the Washington State China Relations Council, and welcome to today's webinar, Life and the Reopening, Stories from Shanghai. Um, some of you may recall that we did a program in early May on life under lockdown in Shanghai when two Washingtonians, Jessica Gleason and Cameron Johnson, uh, who are now living in Shanghai, shared with their unique experience about living under the ex uh, extended lockdown uh, in the city. So today's program is actually a sequel of May's event, and we are delighted to invite Jessica and Cameron back to give us an update on life in Shanghai after the reopening or partial reopening um, since June 1st. Um, in addition, Cameron also just came back from the, from, uh, uh, to the U.S. from Shanghai, and I'm sure he'll have many stories to share about his journey home and his visit on the East Coast. So before we get started, I would like to note that today's event is co-sponsored by the Washington State China Relations Council and the Seattle Shanghai Expat Society. Uh, let me briefly introduce our organization if you're not familiar with us. Founded in 1979, the WCRC is the oldest state level nonprofit organization promoting improved bilateral relations with China. Uh, WCRC ser serves as a thought leader on US China issues, cre uh, creates programs and uh, exchanges to improve mutual understanding, and is a nexus for business and the government leaders on both sides of the Pacific. Um, since the outbreak of COVID-19, we have focused much of our energy on producing webinars on key issues related to China and U.S. China relations, like this one. Um, let me also briefly introduce our partner of the event, the Seattle Shanghai Expat Society. It was started in 2017 by Cindy Zhou, who formed the organization to assemble those with a connection to Shanghai, now living in Seattle. Um, the group provides both a show, social and intellectual platform to help members adjust to their lives in Seattle, um, as well as to stay current with development in China. Uh, in China. Um, the moderator for this, today's discussion is not Kokiard, the WCRC's executive director. Uh, nor spent over 30 years in Asia serving as business executive, um, including 18 years in Shanghai. During that time, he also held numerous positions in business associations, including serving as the chairman of American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. Um, before we get started, let me uh, go over some house, uh, housekeeping items with you. Uh, so please keep your microphone muted throughout the session. If you have questions for our panelists, please type them in the chat box and we'll collect and raise to the panelists during the audience Q&A sessions, and we'll try to answer all of them. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, a link of the recording will also be sent to all event registrants within 48 hours. So now I'm going to turn it over to Noor to introduce our panelists, Jessica Gleason and Kevin Johnson, and start the uh, discussion. Noor. Okay, uh, good af well, good afternoon to those of you in the Pacific time zone. Uh, of course, to Jessica, good morning, and I know to Cameron, it's getting into the evening on the East Coast. Um, as uh, Mon mentioned, we had this webinar a little about six weeks ago when we heard about uh, the lives of these two individuals as they were locked down in their apartments in Puxi and Pudong parts of, of uh, Shanghai. So it's fun today to kind of hear how it's reopened uh, and what their life life is like today. I Mon, Mon calls the title of this Life Under Partial Reopening. I really like Life Under Lockdown, the sequel. And you know, it almost sounds like a blockbuster, but we'll, we'll see how today goes. Okay, just to introduce our speakers, and, and those of you, of course, that were on a month ago are familiar with them. Uh, Cameron uh, Johnson is a Bremerton native. He's a China market and industry specialist with over 20 years of in-country experience. Uh, among his roles in China, he worked for Microsoft, and he was also the Asia general manager for a multinational carbon fiber company. And now he's a business consultant helping a, a number of different companies um, navigate business in China. Uh, Cameron is frequently quoted in the papers these days, such as the Wall Street Journal, the South China Morning Post, as well as other media outlets. Um, besides his day job, Cameron's a board member of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. He's also advisor of the National IDC Technology Innovation Alliance, 
And also I think he lectures uh, at the NYU Shanghai campus. Our other uh, speaker today is Jessica Gleason, who's the CEO of Brighter Beauty and the founder of Experiential Retail. And Jessica is again from the, the Seattle area. She's an experienced international executive with a passion for building and scaling brands. She spent uh, about 20 years with Starbucks in a number of leadership roles um, as the company grew from 50 stores in the US to 55 countries globally. Um, this included Starbucks original market entry into China and initial expansion into the Asia Pacific region. Since leaving um, Starbucks, Jessica helped the Walt Disney Company and Claire's Accessory to build their businesses in China. Today, she's the founder uh, of Experiential Retail, which is a global consulting firm that helps purpose-driven brands scale with integrity. Jessica also serves on advisory roles for a number of retail entities and on the boards of other uh, organizations in China. Okay, so that, that's that's who our speakers for today. So we'll we'll get right into the uh, discussion. And if those of you that were on before last time, we, we were treated to a uh, tour of Jessica's balcony and she showed us um, the foodstuffs, the care packages that were delivered by the local government. And then we also peered over a balcony to see kind of the empty streets, as well as a few people in hazmat suits, or as they're called, big whites wandering around. Yeah. And what also was, I think, quite interesting is, is during, during Jessica's presentation last time, she got a, a message on her phone and said, you need to come down now and get tested. So um, I'd like to invite Jessica to maybe give us a little tour of what life is like now in her neighborhood. So Jessica, please. Yeah, welcome to my balcony again. Uh, so for those of you familiar with Sh uh, Shanghai, uh, my balcony has a view of Yong Kong Lu and Jashan Lu. And I'm just gonna flip my phone around. Um, this is just quickly, we haven't gotten any more care packages from the government since the beginning of June. Our last one was dragon dumplings, but this is how our pepper farm from our uh, Chongming Island peppers is doing. Uh, and now peering over the balcony, you can see that Shanghai is reopen-ish um, down here. Ironically, Zoom doesn't Zoom, so I can't Zoom in for you. But this is the neighborhood fish market. Um, you can see that folks are coming in as they did before lockdown to get their, their fresh uh, seafood produce. Um, the foreign grocery store is reopen. But then if you scale back to Yong Kong Lu, fences are gone, which was one of the big things in the past but the street is very, very quiet um, because restaurants still are not uh, reopened. So while this would normally be filled with people uh, at one of the 17 espresso bars drinking coffee, now it's just folks strolling the neighborhood. And then the last thing, which I'll show you in better pictures when I'm on my computer, is straight over my balcony, these little blue tents down here are now our neighborhood testing sites. Um, and we now need to go for testing on our own. We're not, they don't call us down for testing, but we need you here and go back to my computer. Um, but that is a little picture of live from Shanghai. Where you also, you also noted it's, it's almost 90 degrees today. Yeah, it's 90 degrees, so I'm a little hot. It's a little hot out here. Okay, those, those, those of us in Shanghai, some of us are jealous. Okay, so uh, while Jessica's transitioning uh, back to her other computer, Cameron, can you tell us a little bit about um, basically how your neighborhood opened up and then also how you, you escaped China or got out of China? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... It's, it's partially open. I think um, I, I flew out on day 80 um, back to, back to or not Seattle, back to New York um, from Shanghai. And yeah, the previous, the 24 hours beforehand was, it was just nuts. I had to go get a, a COVID test. Um, the testing facility couldn't print a report in English, which was needed to board the plane. Um, I had to go back and do another one. Um, there were roadblocks were mostly gone by that point, but there were still, you know, um, guards. Every every subdistrict um, that you go into, you know, people stop the cars and ask you, "What are you doing?" Um, I finally um, I left at about 4 a.m. 
uh, on the 30th to kind of leave and get to the airport. And there really wasn't any checkpoints. But once you got to the airport, trying to get in was quite challenging. You, they checked everything. You had uh, your passport, your ticket. Um, you know, the reason you're flying out, uh, your recent uh, testing um, have you been around or in any areas or compounds that have had COVID cases or even COVID, um, potential COVID exposure? And then once we got inside the airport, um, it was a long wait. Uh, absolutely nothing is open. Uh, only one bathroom in the entire airport open. And the day I flew out, there was, and I've been flying in and out of Pudong since I was a kid, there was only one flight, which was Shanghai to New York. And when we got on the plane or in going through all the process, it took about um, two and a half hours from check-in because uh, it's very slow. They check everything, they check all the documentation you, that you can actually go to the States. Um, and then when we hit um, customs, you have to fill out a brand new customs form, which was unique. Um, and then at uh, immigration, uh, there was three people. And it basically, we I flew through, um, just went by really quickly. And then just waited for the plane. And it was the most surreal experience because again, no, absolutely nothing was open. There was nobody in the airport except for that particular flight. Every staff was walking around with um, you know, the big white suits. And it was just surreal. When we got on the plane, the plane itself was um, about 40, 45% full, uh, which was very surprising considering you know, all the people we hear who were leaving. Um, and so it was, yeah. And then it was a 15 hour flight to New York. And the minute we, Touched down and got into New York. Nobody's wearing masks, and it's just you know mad chaos. It was just uh, you know it's quite the different. Uh, you know, I'm standing in line at, at customs uh, or at immigration. You know, and a lot of people going, "Why aren't these people wearing masks? Don't they know we're still in a uh, in a pandemic? Why aren't they wearing masks?" And it was just again, it was a surreal experience um, to go through that. And and I know, like if you fly to Seattle, I thought the plane stopped in Korea. Uh, on the way here, but on yours was direct? It was direct. It was 15 and a half hours. So from Shanghai to New York. Yeah, they didn't stop anywhere. I don't know why, but- uh, And, that's and can, how... can I ask if, would you share with us, do you know what it cost? Oh man. Um, the round trip ticket, including the upcoming testing I have to do is pretty close to 10,000 US dollars. And that's with seats by the bathrooms in the back of the plane. Yeah, that's so, straight basic economy. Yeah, yeah, and so it's uh, it's not uh, it's not cheap. <laughs> yeah, it's, cheap yeah. it's very hard to leave. With that one. <laughs> hard to come back. Right. Easy. So Jessica, do you want to share? What, you've got some a good photo behind you. You want to? Yeah, share? I have an assortment of background pictures I'll put on throughout. Uh, this is a side picture of my neighborhood testing station. So. Um, this is literally just the, what you saw down underneath the trees. Um, and so every morning now, I'm trying to figure out the best angle so you guys can see the pictures. Right. Every morning now, we line up, whether rain or shine. So this was a rainy day lineup. And we do the testing. And in order to get into any, this is uh, on weekends now, they just announced that we're going to have to test in our compound every weekend is a required test and they won't open us up until after you've completed the testing in the morning. Um, so this was an in-compound testing area, but you need this because this is how you get your new green code on your phone. Um, it looks kind of like, oops, this is next. It looks kind of like this. You need this green code that says you've tested within 48 hours um, to be able to get into pretty much anything these days. So if you want to get into Shinton, oh sorry, that's not Shinton D. If you want to get into any office building, there's a sign or any shop, there's a sign like this up that requires you to scan. Um, or some of the nicer buildings will have their own scanner while they scan your green code. But then you can see they're literally queuing everyone up, making sure you scan uh, to get in. Same thing with the DD. If you go into a DD, you have to scan one of these every DD uh, driver. Just, has. just, just, Jessica, a DD. Yeah. What? Get, you said a DD, just to make. Yeah. So to get into a DD, you have to Which, be able to. Uh, okay. So I, I'm just stopping you. A DD mean, means like an Uber. 
right? Yeah, to get into an Uber, thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Been here too long. To get into an <laughs> right. Uber, any car or any shop, you have to be able to scan this mm -hmm. and show your code. And you yesterday uh, at a convenience store, you could see the neighborhood compliance people uh, had the shopkeepers very nervous because uh, someone walked in and hadn't yet uh, scanned. And they're like, you have to go back and scan. You have to go back and scan. Have you seen anybody with a red, the like have a red code or be rejected? Uh, not yet with a red code. We've had neighborhoods that have reclosed down because someone tested positive. So about two blocks from here, there's a compound that got reshut down. And if you are over at the intersection of Shangyang Lu and Julu Lu, uh, there's that whole community also went back into lockdown for two, I think they did two days and then I think it extended past then. And they have guards, et cetera, to make sure people don't they, leave? Yeah, they put the fences back up. So there are a couple places that fences have gone back up. Right, wow, okay. Um, and, and can you just compare and contrast this and back in 2020, and Cameron, jump in here too. Back in 2020, was it any anything like this or how did it work back then? No, back in 2020, we they implemented sort of a very loose contact tracing but then it was just checking that you traveled anywhere that had COVID. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't any process where it updated anywhere like this one does. Um, no, um, there was no testing of your body. So it was just counting, the app was tracking whether you had been next to somebody who mm -hmm. had got sick and then later gone and tested. Whereas today, um, Shanghai has more biometrics on me than anyone in the world, including myself, um, because you literally, it's literally, every, and to make sure that your code stays green within 72 hours, you're basically testing every 48 hours so you don't miss a closed down location or something. And, 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 and yeah, but, and to go back, this 48 hours, is that up to you to show up every 48 hours? Or, yep. So yeah. now instead of having, you know, Cameron and I both had the the lovely wake up calls from our um, our local neighborhood people for several months. Now there's actually an app and this is an example, but it shows you the it's in uh, in the Alipay Health app and it shows you where the testing locations are um, and it's supposed to tell you how long the wait is. That part's a little dicey, <laughs> but hmm. Um, but they're all over the place. And in certain periods, if they're doing mandatory testing, they require that you show your little neighborhood card that says you actually live in this vicinity for that testing location. But most of the time, you can just walk up to it. And again, these are free of charge? Totally free of charge. So um, I find it slightly ironic because I, like Cameron, the testing when I came back last time, uh, was required PCR testing at approved testing sites by the government. Um, but, and it was almost, I want to say $800 for basically four tests. Um, mm -hmm. And now I, I'm, I would be rich if I was getting that money here in Shanghai because we just literally go every day or two. And I'm sure someone is getting rich. So whoever's making PCR tests uh, and antigen tests are doing very well right now. And then, how uh, and then I think yeah, I was going to say, ahead. and I think the other difference in reopening this time is last time they had a very, because we we're still learning, they had a very structured step-by-step -step process um, and they did it sort of by industry. And I think because of sort of where people were psychologically and the sort of greater pressure um, and, and kind of, we can only do so much they opened the whole city up at once on, on June 1st. Um, but it's sort of a bit of a misnomer because they opened it up, but restaurants aren't open, right? So you could walk around, but you couldn't gather and you, yeah. Yeah, there were, there, there were pictures on the news here of people lighting fireworks and drinking champagne on the street and that kind of stuff on June 1st, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. But how, how are you, Cam, how are you notified? Well, I mean, that the, that it, quote, the lockdown was over. 
Uh, well, they had them. Um, so to, the part to get out that I, I forgot is I also had to get permission from my local Jewe so the local neighborhood community. Like they had to personally write out a note and stamp it for me to leave the compound to actually get in a car and to get into the airport. The airport wouldn't, wouldn't let you in unless you had that. Um, and so with that, asking them, so when are you guys planning to be open? They're like, oh, we think maybe this week. And that week was, um, you know, the, the week of June 1st. Um, and, and kind of to Jessica's point, um, I got hundreds, if not many hundreds of messages, essentially when I landed uh, in New York, basically saying, okay, it looks like we're finally open. Um, but at least in our case, two, two of the neighborhoods that quote unquote celebrated were then within 48 hours on lockdown again because of COVID exposure. So, um, you know, it was a very temporary uh, celebration regardless. So that's kind of how I heard. And same, yeah, same and thing. Yeah. Jessica, how, how did they notify you? Is it just. Um, I, I think one of the things I thought was interesting was because they wanted to show Shanghai was reopening. It was pretty much everywhere. It was in Shine. It was in, you know, they were sending out messages from our local community leader. It was in the group chat notifications. Uh, pretty much every piece of press around was saying June 1st opening. And that was very different than what had happened prior to that, where it was kind of very, we'll see what's going on. We're not quite sure. So it was, and I think part of that was that they wanted to send a really clear message um, to all levels of folks that were enforcing as well, because there had been, um, I think, some disparity between compounds or sub-districts around the level of enforcement or, or how, how restricted they were being based on testing results. And um, uh, I think uh, the government, uh, they got to a place where they just wanted clarity and everyone mm. to be getting the same out, out, uh, outcome. Yeah, we've, we've heard about different, uh, particularly different township cities being a bit overzealous, as you said, not letting people through, et cetera. So I, I understand why they, they might've done that. Um, can I ask a question, a little, little different question that is from here, and actually through contacts I have is, um, we heard a lot of people are su suffered through mental stress uh, through this lockdown. Um, have you, and I, I know even on my uh, WeChat with some people uh, in in Shanghai were saying, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? He's, you know, there's issues. So have, have you heard about such things? Is there any anybody making any effort to address these? Um, I don't know if either of you could, uh, I mean, for, for us, I think, you know, the, the, um, um, I think Jessica can speak also to, to, to some of it. We, we all have friends who are in rough spots, um, but it really also is the kids because the kids were basically locked inside for five or six weeks, um, only online classes. You know, the only contact they had was with family and, you know, they did have family around, but, you know, even in our area where there are, you know, it's a, it's a neighborhood full of kids um, that basically, um, you know, it kind of went um, I don't know, haywire to a point. And you could tell, particularly towards the end, like the, it's not just rambunctiousness of kids. It's also just that, you know, they started acting out and they started, you know, complaining and we want to go do stuff and get out. So um, now is that mental health per se? I don't know. But as a kid being cooped up for five or six weeks definitely is not a good thing. And so I think particularly one of the things that I'm looking at as a parent and watching this process in real time is, you know, do I need to be more mindful you know, get them outside more and, you know, work with them more and be with them more because it has been not just challenging because of the isolation, but also the homework. You know, the homework mm -hmm. hasn't stopped. You still have, you know, two, three, four, five hours of homework um, every day. And so again, it just, you know, and again, time, you know, day after day, week after week and month after month, it just becomes an incredible burden. Jessica, what have you found? Yeah, I think uh, I have some friends with small kids and one of their big challenges was, if you've got an active four-year-old boy and he's now <laughs> locked down while parents are needing to be on calls and do business at the same time. Uh, and I think that may not be dissimilar from the US. The difference is people don't have yards here and we weren't able to go down to the, the ground floor in our compounds and let them run around. I think one of the possible wins that comes out of the lockdown though is, I saw more conversations about mental health on in the press, on uh, on WeChat, 
Um, lots of the sort of community organizations that work in that space were out posting um, pretty much any chamber or um, a networking group did some post to one of the resources related to mental health. Um, and I think that um, I didn't show you in my, on my balcony picture, but I have like a bouquet of probably four different uh, groups of flowers right now, um, because I think people did a lot of work reaching out and helping each other navigate through it. And so I think the last week or two has been just, you know, nice appreciation of people thanking each other for those conversations they needed at different times. Um, would you agree, Cam? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you brought up, I mean, it, the one thing that did give us is, you know, I pretty much called everybody who was in my WeChat uh, list um, and friends who, you know, a lot of them who I just hadn't seen or heard from for a long time. So it did kind of give, I think, all of us a bit of a pause to, you know, to do, it just because I do that reach out and, and do just talk about other stuff to give even our own brains a bit of a break. So. Good. Um, well, I know I we, we've heard stories and let's hope that that uh, people come out of this without too much, uh, too much, too many issues. So, um, just one quick question, Jessica and Cameron too. Uh, food stores, well, pretty well open as long as you have your green pass. You can go to the supermarket or the fish market or whatever. If anyone tells you that China does not embrace Costco, they are wrong. <laughs> this is, this picture is from day, I think day three of, no, probably day four of Costco reopening. Um, Costco, though, you needed to, um, uh, to go to the reopening, you needed to uh, go into the app, you had to be a Costco member, and you had to reserve a time. So this is checkout at the time where two groups over overlapped, and this is kind of what it looks like right now. But um, but the first day I went to Costco after lockdown, it was beautiful because I had an eight, eight o'clock time slot and there was no one there. It was the, I had like 20 minutes of really wide aisles in Costco and then it filled into this. So, um, but you're seeing, it's interesting because if you talk about shopping, people are definitely shopping and restocking cabinets. And I see a lot more food shopping than I see um, physical shopping. And part of the challenge is really all of the stores have needed to restock because they were so low on their supplies in the supply chain. So uh, even with Costco, there was plenty of stuff to buy, but it was only yesterday that, you know, you could get uh, Swiss cheese at Costco again, which is like such a staple. <laughs> right. And d would you say there's, there's still fear in the uh, population that you know, they could go be locked down again and therefore they want to make sure they're, they've got plenty of food. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, I, yeah, there's still a lot of, I mean, there's, there's no doubt, I think by most people that we'll be in some form of lockdown again in the fall. And so I think there's a general recognition of, you know, we generally, we need to stock up now and there are, you know, there's dozens and dozens of neighborhoods that are still shut down right now because of COVID cases. Uh, one estimate put it at about 10% of the population of the city is still under lockdown. And so people are still, working through and restocking up, Jessica. So Jessica, the interesting thing is what did you buy at Costco? I mean, that, that's the real important details. Did you buy Tillamook cheese? Like what did you buy? I would <laughs> so have bought Tillamook cheese, but Tillamook cheese is not back in stock yet. Um, no, I mean, for us it was, we, um, and I actually don't have that picture, but we poured the last of our coffee supply um, into our um, coffee machine about two days before uh, lockdown ended. And I had a backup one that a friend from, um, from Starbucks had sent me. But we, um, so we backstocked on coffee, um, some canned goods that are very US style. But I think we weren't the typical cart at Costco. Um, what was really interesting to see is Costco's done such a great job of sort of being the curator of great meat products and great vegetable products that if you looked at the carts at Costco, and I think the first time we went there, we were the only foreigner in the Costco shopping group. And then the second time there were a few more, but it was a lot of restocking on sort of favorite treats and for good meals with your family. So a lot of really nice beef got sold, a lot of seafood. The section of Costco that was packed, packed was that 
fresh, um, fresh meat, fresh seafood section, fresh veggie section. Um, we shopped more the what can you store for a long time section. <laughs> yeah, so, so you are anticipating you may be locked down again. Right. But lockdown or supply chain um, bumps, right? right. Because right. as people restock, it's going to take um, a while for things to come back in. So right. China teaches well, you weird hoarding habits. <laughs> right. Well, our, I'm sure our, our friends at Costco are enjoying this conversation. Uh, Cameron, you're back in D.C. Are, are you going to talk? Are you talking to people on the Hill? What, what are you doing in D.C.? Uh, yeah, no, um, I have I have a little bit. Um, a lot of it also is um, you know, hitting kind of the major players: state, commerce, treasury. Um, you know, it's it's challenging because nobody from here has been to China for years, and vice versa. So you can see large gaps, not just of communication but understanding. Um, there's also a bunch of new laws that are potentially coming down. Um, you know, that we've given feedback on. There, there's a new and potential investment law about restricting investment. It's basically called, it should be called the, we want to stop investment in China law. Um, so that is, is very prevalent. Um, the new USICA Act or you know, some version of the CHIPS Act where they, you know, the 50 billion plus dollars in CHIPS, um, things like that. And just trying to give feedback on, you know, here's how it's being interpreted. Here's, will it work or not? Um, there's another theme about supply chains and nearshoring and friendshoring. Um, and it doesn't seem there's a lot of understanding generally on supply chains, which, you know, given again, the last couple of years is, isn't surprising. Um, but it's been, it's been a bit eye opening because, um, it is generally not positive. Um, there is nobody at all here who will even go out on the smallest of limbs and, um, uh, do anything that might even be perceived as friendly to China. Um, and also the, it's interesting to see this debate on tariffs. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the other part that I've, I've been seeing and, and listening to um, you know, the different entities go back and forth about tariffs. Should we, should we not? Um, you know, the, the general fact is there's more factories today in China than there were before the trade war. So whatever it was that we did absolutely was useless to be honest. Um, and again, trying to put that in a fairly polite way to, <laughs> to, to our, um, we're policymakers, um, and also, you know, to be to them, also be a resource. And guys, this is what happened on the ground in Shanghai. Here's how U.S. businesses and business in general is being affected. Here's how it will affect U.S. business here in the states. Here's how it's going to affect your Christmas supply. So those kinds of discussions um, are ongoing. And again, it's just interesting to kind of get their perspective and see. Because I will be, you know, in about a month, I'm flying back to China, and that'll be helpful for us in our own discussions internally, you know, back in country. And was there much curiosity about the lockdown? Uh, there was some. I, I think, you know, the, the, everybody has seen the pictures and the videos, um, but there's just, it seems, a lack of understanding of the actual impact of the lockdown. Now, some of that is because it just hasn't quite hit us yet. Um, but, I mean, these are cascading impacts all throughout every major supply chain in the world. And, you know, that we just haven't quite felt it here yet. Um, you know, one of the things that I have flagged them with is that when you have this disruption, plus the potential longshoremen strike on the West Coast uh, July 1st, I mean, that's really going to ratchet up challenges. And if you think inflation's bad now, just watch till that starts cascading through, you know, those two things coming together, cascade through the economy. And so, you know, again, it's also just trying to flag them like, here's other things that are going on that, you know, it could be helpful to be mindful of. Good. Now, again, I'd encourage uh, people on, on the listening today to put their questions in the chat box. I haven't seen many come in. I'm, I, we'd love to have those. But so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, business. Uh, I, a question to both of you. So are businesses getting back up to speed? I mean, last time we talked, you know, people were their workers were living in the Tesla plant or the GM plant and there were closed loop systems, et cetera. Are people able to go home now and, you know, come to work like a, like they did in the past or what's happening now? Yeah, so heavy testing uh, and able to come to work, but I think uh, it's um, offices have been slow to require people come to come back to the office. I think, um, I was trying to think of the best analogy and I, I finally landed on kind of an earthquake. When you get done with the main part of an earthquake, 
your you inside you you want to really rebuild get back to get back to you know getting things looking good and, and moving along but you're cognizant that there are still some aftershocks coming and i think that's what we're seeing um with sort of the strategy for office reopening um i think people are still very intentional about the number of people whose paths they cross and how many cross um, circles of people they interact with um, because they've been very clear that they're going to be active in tracing the tail of anyone who had COVID and that you'll definitely go back into some sort of restricted quarantine if you were considered a close contact or secondary close contact to first people. So I think that's really affecting um, people's behaviors. Uh, so this is, um, if you're familiar with IAPM, this is yeah. IAPM last night at 6.30 p.m., right? right? Yeah. So it is crickets, quiet, um, because people are who are going back to the office are going very clearly um, from the office to, um, to work and not a lot of sort of going around and shopping uh, in between that. So yeah, just just to elaborate for our viewers, um, that's a retail space, but there's two big office towers connected to it, right? Yeah. So there would yeah. normally be shoppers away. and and workers in there. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and diners. Nothing. And Lord, to your point on on the manufacturing side, I mean, you know, like you know, Tesla, all, all these plants that had workers in them for almost two months, the workers are getting burned out, and so they want a break. But if you get a break, you know, production is also going to go down. So there's a real uh, tug and pull at the moment in a lot of um, industries and, and plants as to how to deal with that because the workers are tired. A lot of them haven't been home for almost two months, if not longer. And so, you know, there's some factories who are throwing more uh, money at them to keep them on and okay, we'll have more of a stable um, a workflow and things. But again, it, you can't take, you know, you can't do it forever, kind of that closed loop and then you know, people want to break. And so this is kind of the next thing we're going to see. So even if you can restart as a business, you might have real trouble, you know, maintaining capacity at, at a decent level because people want to break. You know, they want to go home and, and do something else for a bit. So recharge. And so on that kind of supply chain or logistics, maybe logistics is a better word. So are, are trucks able to move around the city, move to Wuxi or Hangzhou or places like that? That's so there are, you know, trucks in the city generally are moving. Uh, the highway to Suzhou, I confirmed this morning, is still blocked off from Shanghai to Suzhou. Uh, it actually has three barriers, each one taller than the other uh, in the middle of the highway. So it's there's still limited transportation around the YRD. Um, and when will that open? Nobody really knows. Uh, remember, the KPI for the government is COVID case count. That is what they are being measured on, not GDP, not growth rate. And even though they want to open up, which is true, I, I don't doubt that, but the COVID case count is the KPI. So when we and particularly as a chamber, one of the things we're talking about is how can we help the government? And so, you know, myself, I when I talk to companies, be mindful that that is the case count and how can you help the government achieve that? Well, you have to have, you know, good COVID protocols. You need to make sure all your testing spec, you know, everything is, is up to snuff because if not, not only will you get nailed, but you'll make the local officials look bad and it will cause you further problems down the road. So there's things like that to be mindful of as well. Right. So tell us, tell me that. So what if you want to go to Suzhou? Can you get on the train and go to Suzhou? I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of places, because we have, we all have travel codes. Um, if you have a star on your travel code, you are automatically quarantined for two weeks, wherever you go. And so um, in Shanghai, there's still outbreaks in Shanghai. So if you go there, you'll probably be stuck in a quarantine hotel for two to three weeks. Um, if not longer, depending on the situation. So no, there really is no movement of people even back and forth yet, at least that yeah, I see. It, yeah, no, and they just published, I just saw, and I can try and track it down and send it to you know, if you're curious, but they just published a list of quarantine protocols for all the different cities and provinces in China. So it's literally anything from seven to 21 days, depending on what that government uh, or that group is, is deciding to do. Um, but definitely, you know, I have a trip to Chengdu I want to do, but if I went right now, I'd be going and spending a week in quarantine before I had a single hot pot. 
Right, right. And coming back, you don't know what would might happen. Yeah, I'm not sure coming back. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, Jessica, could, could you, I don't know if you can find it. Can you go back to the Shinten D picture photo you had? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me just give me a second to okay. that. Those, those, um, those of you that are going into okay. Shinten D or enjoying it. Yeah, that, that one just was a checkpoint. Yeah. yeah. So is this, this is, uh, yeah, this is actually, I think, pa yeah, past the checkpoint. Let me see if I can find the checkpoint. You had the Make one sure. with Starbucks up earlier, right? Yeah, let me just, I just need to scroll back to get it for you. Uh, mm. And while I'm scrolling, this is what outside every compound looks like right now um, with people just working to restock um, uh, their supplies. Here we go. There we go. Is that the one? Okay. Yeah. And the only reason I bring that up is I think man, many people on this call have probably been to Shinten D and there's the famous Starbucks, which is where you'd meet your friends, et cetera, on the right there. So behind your shoulder there, is that kind of the guard checking your uh, your pass so you can get into the, the complex? Is that how it works? Yeah, exactly. So you have to you have to show go through the line and you have to can you can you swing code. over to the yeah, there sorry. you go. Okay, there you there go. go. So okay. you have to go through the line and show your code. And there's only one way entrance into Shintindi. So you enter on the Starbucks side and you exit on the gelato side next to the 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 home of the first communist party first meeting. Party, yep. Yeah. Right. And um, what's interesting is inside Shintindi, they had that first weekend a lot or, or last weekend, a lot of people who were kind of fudging on outdoor dining where maybe the tables were there and then people would have their food in a takeaway container. Um, but I think there was too much activity. So this week we saw a very, it's very clean there, <laughs> hardly anyone there. The only thing that's really active once you're inside is Shake Shack. Um, and I, I was thinking about it yesterday when I was looking at it, because all the influencers were hanging out, taking their pictures there and things like that. And I think part of it is you know, Shake Shack is designed to be on the go dining. So um, it was easy for people to go meet their friend and then sit on a little corner ledge and enjoy their burger. Good. All right, so questions are coming in now from uh, okay. from the participants. So, um, and and Edward Allman missed, uh, Ted Alden missed Cam's describing how he got out of the country, but so we won't go all through it, but Cam, you said you left home at four o'clock. What time was your flight? 11.30 in the morning. 11.30. So you're six and a half hours before the flight, you you basically, or seven, sorry, seven and a half hours before the flight, you you left and to get through all those procedures, et cetera. And, yeah. and you were at the gate cleared of all that stuff two hours before the flight? About two hours, you know. So, you know, my normal um, uh, Korean food kimchi, you know, shop was, of course, closed. So you basically, you just sit there and wait. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so and, Ted, it took it. Yeah. Oh, good. I was going to say, and it's changed since Cameron came back. So now, you know, the, you're required to share your health code, but it's much easier to get through the airport now. You can go there on any transportation mode you want. Yeah, now now that you've opened, so to speak, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and Cam, we had a question of what you think the impact of the lockdown might be on us here in Washington and in the PNW. Um, yeah, I mean, if anything, uh, anybody getting parts or material out of China is going to be hit, uh, particularly if it's from the YRD. If it's from the Shenzhen, you know, Guangzhou area, then you'll probably be a little bit safer. Uh, so that's the first. Second is um, anything going there, um, because there's still, the trucks still aren't running effectively. So if you're shipping stuff into the Shanghai port, or even Ningbo, or even Qingdao, a little bit north, you're still going to be, you're still going to have slowdowns. So... Um, what we're seeing generally is a, is an elongated uh, time frame, uh, in some cases double for delivery. Uh, we don't quite know yet uh, the impact on parts suppliers, um, although there there will be one. Uh, automotive, for example, there are you know the, some of the plants in the Midwestern stuff are, are really short of parts right now. So I know that some companies are actually air freighting them out of Shanghai um, into the U.S. to ensure that they don't you know automotive has enough problems already, right? So um, 
Yeah, but it was make no mistake, it will cascade through. And again, we're all watching July 1st because if the longshoremen go on strike, then it really is going to be two massive tsunamis hitting together at the same time. So that's what we need to be mindful of. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I've read about the longshoremen strike uh, off and on in the last six months to a year, but actually in the news here recently, I have seen very little about it. So. Well, I mean, it, you know, we're watching it in Shanghai, in China, because, of course, it affects business, particularly in L.A., and we're all like, what else is going to hit us this year? <laughs> it's just, you know, it's one thing after another that keep, they keep rolling into each other. Yeah, so. and, of course, you saw the Fed raise the uh, interest rate 75 basis points today. Yeah. So that that's one way to, to, to attack inflation. But if the longshoremen go on strike, <laughs> it's not going to help much. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, uh, well, other questions we had. Uh, Jerry was asking about wages. Are wages being impacted? Or are they going up because of this? They keep you know keep people at work. Or so. Uh, and, and Jerry, thanks for your comment earlier. It is nice to actually be on the screen versus a versus a picture on LinkedIn. Um, no, in in Guangzhou and southern China, we aren't seeing any wages move at all. Uh, in Shanghai. We're generally seeing it for, you know, like workers in Tesla, for example, got a 400 RMB a day bonus if they worked there. Uh, I know they're actually discussing upping that because they don't want workers to, to leave because, you know, they've been in locked or not, they've been in a closed loop for a couple months. Um, but in terms of businesses, no, because everything is still stuck. I mean, in our side, you know, and, and one question came through about um, payments. So we, we paid our employees everything, full freight. Uh, full salary, uh, all of the benefits, we paid our rent. Uh, we don't get any, at least at this point, any compensation whatsoever. And we had almost no revenue for three months and so, or for two and a half months. So um, in that regard, there is nothing. And so wages aren't going up unless you're in a critical need area where companies are like, I have to have you on site. Jessica, what are you saying? Yeah, and I think that um, one of the things that's been interesting is, you know, because la good labor is hard to, like, if you're in a restaurant, good labor is hard to find, so you want to keep it there. So definitely we saw, you know, people um, paying their their folks as much as they could, as long as they could. I did see, as I've been walking around the last few days, you're starting to see those uh, shops that are closing and whether they're closing from distress um, or they were going to close before anyway, mm -hmm. um, a little hard for me to tell. But um, you definitely uh, have the pressure um, on the PL. Uh, there have been a rollout of stimulus packages mm -hmm. that have gone out, but for a lot of the, particularly the SMEs, their um, it, their ability to actually relieve some of the pressure from the heads of the company um, have not um, worked. There's a, a, a policy that's out that if you're a government uh, tenant, then your rent is relieved for like six months. But if the landlord is the government tenant and you rent from that landlord, um, they're not necessarily trickling that benefit down. So I have a lot of friends that have been trying to argue are you negotiate with their landlords around <laughs> reduced fees? Um, and because some of that stimulus will come later, the landlords are saying, no, wait, we're also feeling the pressure. And so we aren't going to give you a, a roll down because we're not necessarily getting it right now. Hmm. So, but I, I mean, do know like Starbucks, I checked in with um, my friends over there and they paid, um, not surprisingly, because they tend to take care, good care of people. They, they, um, they paid folks uh, through the whole time, whether it was open or closed. Yeah, just 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 a quick comment. And I mean, here in the U.S., here in Seattle, I mean, in my neighborhood in Queen Anne, here the local diner shut down. You know, when the pandemic came, and it's never reopened. You see quite a yeah. few businesses that did not reopen, particularly in the service industry um, here here in the U.S. And I um, think you're gonna. So I think you're going to see that in weak real estate locations. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's an opportunity for brands to, as, as international brands, maybe consolidate some of their portfolio. Um, there's going to be opportunities uh, for local players to grab some of the great real estate sites that flip as well. And we did see, I saw two new coffee brands yesterday <laughs> that have entered the market since I went home for Christmas. So that was mm -hmm. interesting. So... Jessica, you you 
touch upon and a couple questions we're getting now is so one is there do you anticipate or you're seeing a big expat uh, exodus and what about companies i may be a bit too early but do we see companies that are thinking about uh, moving headquarters, Malaysia, Singapore, and other places. Yeah. And I guess you could I, mention the schools too while you're at it. Yeah, um, so all, sort of all of the above. I, I, I'll leave Cam to do the stats on the expat departures because AmCham just did a survey again on that. Um, I will just say that you definitely feel it in the, you know, in my compound, you see people leaving every day. Um, there are no going away parties, but people are sending you the, hey, let's meet up sometime in Europe or Southeast Asia um, text messages. Um, so um, I think that in the international community for folks that are staying, there's a little bit of FOMO of like, I think I want to stay, but am I sure? Um, and I think that it's going to be interesting this summer because we even some people that may stay are definitely going to be out of out of country for the summer. They're ready for a break. Um, I think with businesses, too early to tell. I think you see some consolidation of maybe um, ideas that they were testing. So IKEA just announced that they are um, closing down one of their locations in Shanghai that was a new business model. It was a neighborhood store concept, so a smaller 4,000 foot square foot uh, footprint, but they were really um, clear that they were not leaving China, that they were still sticking with China uh, um, for the long run. So, I, yeah. So I, I, I think that people who have a long game on China um, are going to just wait for the ground to settle, and then we'll look for where the opportunities are with people who maybe had smaller checkbooks or um, less or more risk adverse, but at least the last time we saw some bumps in the road, there were some great opportunities in real estate to, to negotiate some great deals on leases, so. We, we, I'm sure you'd hate to see Ikea go, where else, where else can you go to shop and take a nap at the same time? Yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> right. So they're Thanks. staying there, they have four stores in Shanghai, so they're, okay. they're very clear on those four, they're just closing the little small one. Right, Cam, Cam you got a comment on this? Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, you know, I, again, being in D.C. Uh, the last week or so, uh, much to the chagrin of our politicians and policymakers, businesses are not leaving China. They're just not. Sorry. Um, they're just not. And so um, what they are doing, though, and what we are starting to hear, and again, we'll have to see what actually happens. We are starting to hear that if business, if the investment in business case is to expand capacity for China so we can continue to sell it to China, then we'll probably do it. But the days of you know, adding additional capacity into China to you know, see it Southeast Asia or other, or other areas, uh, maybe even in the States or Europe, uh, is probably gone, at least now. And so what you are shifting, seeing is people and companies discussing shifting investment plans into Southeast Asia, particularly a little bit into Latin America, um, what was Eastern Europe before the current excitement there. Um, but they're just not leaving. And, and in terms of expats, so, and I would encourage all of you to go, uh, if I can tout Amcham Shanghai for a moment, <laughs> go to a recent mini survey that was just released this morning, uh, US time. And in the survey, which actually I'm surprised about, um, and I will read you directly, nearly, nearly three quarters of respondents, which uh, 133 member companies um, uh, responded. So nearly three quarters, 74%, had no unexpected resignations of expatriate staff due to the recent lockdowns. Um, now, I read this a couple different ways. One is uh, we are not seeing staff uh, resign, which is a good thing. Uh, two, it doesn't mean they won't move, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean they won't, for example, move to a Singapore and maybe they will do, um, you know, run, because uh, usually if you're in China, you have some form of Asia, particularly East Asia responsibility. So maybe you can do it out of Singapore. Um, the other thing is it does not involve teachers. And we know for a fact that schools are gonna lose a lot of teachers. Um, one school I talked to just before I left at the end of May, so they predicted upwards of 50%. Um, and there's nobody coming in to replace it. And so how does that actually spill through you know, the expat community and schools? We just don't know yet. Ask it, you know, nor we should have a, you know, a part due you know, um, a follow-up maybe in a couple months after I go through my excitement of returning 
But again, we're, we're not seeing it. We're not seeing supply chains move. You know, supply chains is not a cup where you can just take and move it from one side of the table to the other. Uh, but we are starting to see a consideration again of, hey, maybe we should uh, put capacity into other areas. Doesn't mean we won't be in China, but if we're going to have something new, we should look at going somewhere additional to kind of um, be more resilient. And I think that just tagging on that sort of the new stuff that's been buzzing around the last 72 hours here is I think you see the government acknowledging that there is some excess pressure on expats. Um, so, and, and just that travel and trade piece. So they announced that PU letters aren't going to be required anymore, which was a huge first step. And um, Jessica, again, what's I, a PU letter? You know what? I don't actually know what PU stands for. I think it's a. I don't know. I don't know. A, it's a letter. Basically, it's the letter you need to get. It's like public something, but it's the letter you need to get to do the first step for getting your visa into China. And it requires that your company submit documents uh, to the local government where your company is licensed and that they then stamp and approve your right to apply for a visa. Uh, is that. I think that's my best summary of it. But yeah, I, I thought it was like a letter of invitation that yeah. had to be approved by the gov by the government. Yeah, yeah. it's all that's of that. A it's everything. Way to that. Say that. Yeah. yeah, and so now they're saying that you can just go ahead through the application process like before 2020. Um, so I thought that was great. I also thought it was interesting that um, on two different occasions now, um, the Exit Entry Bureau. Uh, and the Shanghai government have reached out on surveys to get insights from expats about where the pain points are and how they can make it better. So you're hearing conversations around extending the time period for residence permits and for work permits uh, in the future as, as a way to reduce it. Definitely, they've heard the message on travel. Uh, so a new policy released yesterday uh, says that if you have family overseas, they can now apply to come and visit you, um, even though tourism is not open. So my mom has a 10 year visa for China and she hasn't been able to come over and anyone with a tourist visa hasn't, but they've now yesterday announced that if you as a family member want your family member to come visit you in China, you can apply for an exception and they've created a new channel for that. Hmm. And, and that's expats only you think? No, I, I think um, I think expats. <laughs> I'm just thinking of it from the expat filter. Uh, they said, it, uh, but I think actually the policy was more targeted towards international because it said if you have a residence permit, uh, sorry, if you have a green card, China green card, or if you have a residence permit, you now have the ability to apply for this. I okay. think if you were a China passport holder, you all you had that ability before. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, I think a number of people have explained in the chat what a P, what PU means, which is basically okay, invitation good. letter. Right, right. so that, thank, th you. thank you folks for clarifying that. Okay, we're, we're getting uh, close to the end. Uh, just a couple more. Um, do you see the model where the, uh, the executive or li lives in Shanghai and the family is now gonna go live in Singapore or KL or something like that since schools are gonna be tougher to get teachers, et cetera? Any, yes. Any talk? Yes. Seen that? I, I, I know several who have said that they're either, Singapore seems to be one, um, Thailand is another. Um, I have heard even KL. And yeah, it's, I will, my family will be here and, you know, I'll go into China as needed. Um, you know, because again, usually they have Asia, you know, Asia at large roles anyway. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it kind of works out for them. But yeah, absolutely. We've, we've heard that a couple of times. Um, that there's different people who are doing that. And so how will that affect business? I don't know. But I think, again, the next couple of months we'll be telling us to see how, how that shift actually turns out. Good. Okay. And may, may, maybe, maybe the last one here. Um, bulk buying and bartering uh, was quite common as when you're all locked down. Uh, do you think that will continue? Is that, is that and I know Jessica talked, I think well, you, both of you talked about community kind of building and togetherness during the lockdown. Is that fraying now yeah. or is that still going on? No, I think, so you can see behind me, um, this oh. is actually from yesterday or the day before yesterday, well after lockdown ended. And this is another bulk buy. So I think bulk buys 
where there's something that you use on a regular basis, so milk or fresh fruit, and somebody who has kind of made a decide hustle to will continue. I think day-to-day -day bulk buys on, I don't know, random kitchen things that you don't need, those, those are going to go away and people can now buy, you know, I don't need to buy six pounds of avocados. I can buy three at a time. Um, but I do think the power of the group buy um, is still alive in, in the communities. Just now it's more uh, recreational and for special uh, deals and special things versus uh, functional from before. And the avocado lady still up and running? She's up and running. I went by her store a couple days ago. Uh, she's she's doing well. For, the, for those of you who don't know what I'm referring to, there is a, a, a famous, well, there's a, a merchant, a Chinese, a Shanghainese lady who started a shop um, that's, and she became known as the avocado lady and it's, it's, Stocks lots of foreign food, so all the expats like to go to that shop. Okay, I think uh, it's time to wrap up. Uh, any closing comments by I, either of you? Um, I, I, I guess my last thing was: Has anybody discussed the fact that the China, that the Shanghai government said that it was you can't declare the end of a lockdown because there never was an official lockdown? It's a lockdown. Don't call it a lockdown situation. It's a lockdown, but don't call it a lockdown situation. Is that the semantics? Pretty much. Jessica? I, I haven't heard that much discussion oh. on that one. Okay. Well, here, here on our side, uh, there it's been published that the, China, the Shanghainese government said, you can't declare the end of a lockdown because we never officially declared a lockdown. Something of that nature. So, yeah. but, um, I, I think those one. of you that lived through it would have called it a lockdown. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay, well, it's time to wrap up. I see one or two comments saying people enjoyed the discussion. I thought it was was really fun. I thank you two for uh, making yourselves available on CAM, particularly uh, late in the evening on the East Coast. Um, I think you bring up a good point. It would be fun to come back maybe once school year starts and see how many families returned and if business is back to normal and, and what's happening. So uh, we'll, we'll look forward to doing it again. Okay, Jessica, enjoy your day, even though it's thank you. 98 degrees or whatever. And uh, for the rest of our audience, thank you again for participating. Um, and I could just add that we we have a, our next program will be in, uh, I think it's the second week of July after the, uh, after the holiday. And we're gonna have Kevin Shimoda, who wrote this book called Super App, um, which is, he's a, he's a guy from Washington state who went to work for Tencent for four or five years and was involved with a lot of WeChat in the beginning. So um, he's going to come on and talk about his new book. So that, that should be really interesting. Another another Washingtonian in China. Thanks, guys. Great. Have a good night. Bye. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.